So what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about weightlessness, how to lose weight. Okay. For you. Okay. No. And uh, we will try to solve some gravitational field problems. We will probably have to do some more of that tomorrow. No. Okay. As far as we but let's uh, let's jot a few ideas down about gravity. I've been giving you a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I, actually, I shouldn't say jot them down. You guys do what you want. I will post them. Don't get out. I will post them. I strongly urge you do not write everything down. Yes, sir. But having said that, there might be something that you for sure want to have, right? Yeah. So I would prepare to write some stuff down. Just don't feel the need to write everything down. Like, please do not write down my lame attempt at humor. Unless you so want, maybe save it for yourself. For future reference. All right, your butt out. Boot up the learning module. Time to go. That badminton's a tough sport. <coughs> okay. Okay, don't write this down. Historical background. During the Great Plague of 1665, you heard of the Black Death, the bubonic plague, the plague that swept Europe. Wasn't a lot of hygiene, right? So uh, Newton, in his younger days, there he is there, sporting the 20-year-old mullet of the 1665s. Newton was home from college because they shut everything down because of the plague. And he didn't want to just do nothing, so he began thinking about gravity. Connor, ear butt out and listen. A century before him, a guy by the name of Johann Kepler developed laws to explain the motions of planets. And in fact, Kepler's laws are still valid today. Um, Kepler was one of those guys that was amazing at math, like just amazing, right? And he came up with all sorts of crazy formulas that really didn't work out, but he eventually got straightened out. Um, anyways, Newton wondered if the same force that caused an apple to fall on the ground from a tree. You know the classic story about Newton probably getting hit on the head with an apple. Probably didn't happen. Um, historians believe that he was probably saw an apple fall, saw the moonlight, or the moon in the daytime, you know how sometimes you see it, and realized that the moon fell, apples fall, and thought to himself, I wonder if that's the same uh, phenomena here, right? So, skip ahead a little bit, and he came up with this, which is the law of universal gravitation. Do not write it down. Between every two objects, there exists a force of attraction. I am attracted to my water bottle. We've been through this, I think, right? Did I go through this with you? Yeah, this seems familiar. Yeah. I did. Okay. This force is proportional to the quantity of their masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the sides. In other words, the more mass the two objects are, the more gravitational force between them, and the closer I am to the water bottle, the greater gravitational force. How much force is there between me and the water bottle? Not right now. Right, between no. Well, there's actually some, but the water bottle is also attracted to the computer. To Monique, to Nick, to the door, right? Being pulled in all sorts of directions, right? By the tiniest of forces. Newton wrote it as a formula. F, don't write it down. F equals big G M1 M2 over R squared. I think it was on one of the videos just the other day, was it not? I remember seeing it. G just happens to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 31. One of those stupid things that I like to remember. You don't need to write it down. Anyone know what the M1 and the M2 are? The two masses. And they are? The distance. The radius. And because G is such a small number, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 31, so in other words, 30 zeros, 667, the resulting force is very small. How come the force between, say, the Earth and the Moon is relatively large? Because masses are giant. The distance is quite long, right? But the masses are giant. And there is that force. Okay. You do not need to solve problems with that formula. That's a grade 12 concept, okay? But you need to understand that everything attracts everything else. That's about all you really need to know. Okay? Good. The region around a mass in which a second mass will experience the gravitational force is described as a gravitational field. That's the definition for gravitational field. You hear about force fields in the movie, right? 
Do force fields exist? They do. You're all sitting in one right now. You're sitting in the Earth's gravitational field. Now, the concept of a field is kind of important to some people. That might be a good idea to have jotted down. I'll pause there for a second. So the region around a mass in which a second mass will experience a gravitational force is described as a gravitational field. You all have your own gravitational field as well. It's just really small. Everything has a gravitational field around it. And the strength of the field at any place is defined as the gravitational force that a unit mass defined one kilogram would experience if placed there. If you were to put a one kilogram object, if I go and get a one kilogram mass in the back, right, and stick it here on the table, how much force Nick applies to it is defined as Nick's gravitational field. Does Nick's gravitational field exist all around him in three dimensions? Left, right, up, down, every direction. Exactly. Just like the Earth, right? Okay, so this, if you're really kind of keeping score at home, that is technically one of the outcomes, I think. To find the gravitational field as the unit gravitational force that the unit mass is carrying in place there. I'm not so sure that it's that useful down the road. But. What do these gravitational fields look like? This strength is represented by the letter G. I'm dealing with this with grade 12 as well. When a gravitational field is drawn, the field lines are now this is important. This, if you're writing anything down, that's the most important. The field lines are closer together where it is strong and where it is weaker, they are further apart. I'll let you think about that for a second. Now these green arrows vectors. Your gut's probably telling you, yeah. Right? They look like vectors. They're arrows. They're pointy. They're long. That's a vector. Well, they're sort of kind. When a gravitational field is drawn, and I've drawn it here in green arrows, the field lines are closer together where it is strong. These are actually called field lines. They are not vectors. They are field lines. Where it is weaker, they are further apart. So tell me where here, in our little description, our picture of the Earth's gravitational field, where are the green field lines closest together? Yeah, at the Earth's surface, right? Strong there. Weaker there, right? Does that make sense? Do these field lines extend <coughs> past that yeah. white box? Absolutely, right? I don't think I can come up with green, but... <laughs> and again, as you get farther apart, it becomes even weaker. It's the density of the field lines that matters. Okay? It's the distance that they are apart. Now, is that an accurate representation? Like in the Earth's gravitational field, would there be more of these? Yeah, like, I mean, this is just a very simplistic kind of thing, right? Okay. Do objects, like, say I draw an object right there, is it in the Earth's gravitational field? Yeah. It is. It's like, you can see it, it's in between the lines, right? The objects don't need to be, or I can't do it, the objects don't need to be on those lines to experience a gravitational field. That's silly, right? So that's why they're not vectors. Okay? If I were to draw, and I'm going to come back to this again, if I were to draw the force that these objects would experience, I'd have to draw a vector there, and I'd have to draw a vector there, and the farther apart, the, or farther away, the smaller they would be, and down here they would be giant, right? And if I wanted to draw the gravitational field vectors, for every point, well, then I would have a page full of arrows and you wouldn't be able to see anything, right? Be useless. That's why we do this electric field line mumbo jumbo. Yeah. What you need to know is that they're strong where it's close together and weak where it's farther apart. And it actually follows, and I think more on this to come, the inverse square law. If you're twice as far, it's one quarter as strong. Three times as far, 
one ninth as strong. Most things are like that. Gravity, magnetism, sound, light, right? As you get farther away from objects, they get dimmer, right? As you get farther away from things, they get quieter. Even kids, they get, get far enough away from them. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the, the Earth's gravitational field strength, and, and relatively speaking, you can't get much farther away from the center, right? Like, if you go downtown to the high rise, you're not getting that much farther away from the center. You're not going to notice any difference. Now, this diagram implies that gravity is weaker as you climb an altitude. As I said, you go to the top of the high rise, gravity is a little bit less, right? And as you go higher and higher and higher, less and less gravity. And if you were to graph gravity at different altitudes, what do you think that graph would look like? Think if I had like altitude along the x, height so along the x, Everest, gravity is less. gravity's less at the top of Mount Everest, minimally less, like what like tenth of a percentage point. But as you go higher and higher and higher, as the altitude goes up, the gravity goes down. This is a inverse relationship. As the amount of time you spend on your phone goes up, your marks go down. It's an inverse relationship. Oh. Maybe you didn't know that. Now, right here, I've got at about 400 kilometers up, it's about 9.5 newtons per kilogram. Is that a whole lot less than 9.8? No. 400 kilometers up. Imagine to Winnipeg, straight up. How far did Felix Baumgartner go? You remember? I don't remember. Certainly less than 400 kilometers. Yeah, I would think. 400 kilometers is a long ways up. Okay, so what does that mean? Aren't space shuttle astronauts that orbit around about 400 kilometers, aren't they weightless? Like, aren't they floating around up there, playing with their toothpaste and... No, they're not. You've seen them. You've seen Howard Wallowitz floating around up there. How far is our like, gravitational bubble? How far out does our field go? Well, it encompasses the moon. It's what holds the moon in place. How, about, like, how far do you have to go to like, like, escape the Earth's atmosphere? Atmosphere or gravity? The atmosphere. Uh, I think the atmosphere is about 20 kilometers. So it's a, relatively speaking, it's a thin, tiny little skin around the Earth. So what's going on? How come these spatial astronauts are sort of floating around? Well, it's what we talked about yesterday, as Tom Petty sang about. They are indeed... Go ahead, Lady, sing it for us. What? You going to sing it for us? Free fall. Thanks, Lady. It's like they've got Tom Petty on repeat. Non-stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said sing it for us. Yeah, I just did. <laughs> so, the space shuttle astronauts and anything else in orbit are actually falling forever. They're falling. That's falling. Free falling. Anything in orbit. Astronauts, International Space Station, satellites that run your phones, satellites that run TV stations, anything that's up there is falling towards the Earth. How come we're not bombarded with things daily? Because they're also moving sideways. Exactly. Isn't that like 17 times a day they go around the Earth? Uh, it's every 90 minutes, I think. Once every 90 minutes they go around. As I toss the ball to Billy, right? see that arc? So if I threw faster, how much arc is there? I'm going to throw a little, actually I'm going to throw it softer, so I'm afraid. Throw it softer, so it's more arc, right? Okay, so if I throw it really, 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 really fast, it's going to go almost straight. A little arc on it, right? No, I might tear a rotator cuff. I'm old. Here's the picture. They're also traveling at a great velocity. So this is the velocity here. Don't write this down yet. I'm going to give you a chance to draw that picture right away. That's the velocity, but this is the acceleration, which is the change in velocity. So where does it end up going along this 
dotted line. Right? And once it gets to here, well, now it's going this way, but it's falling this way. So where does it go? In between. And it just keeps on like doing that, right? Eventually, this object would have hit the ground, but because the ground isn't there anymore, it's sort of like it's gone around the corner. Does that sort of kind of make sense? Can you stop it from going sideways? Well, anything in orbit's going really, 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 like, we're talking really fast, right? Yeah. Can you stop it? I guess. Like, I mean, if you could go up and sabotage the International Space Station by stopping it from going, it would eventually fall to the Earth, yes. Now, remember, once they get it going, Amanda, do you need a force to keep it going? What's slowing the International Space Station down? Nothing. There's no air resistance. Right? It's the perfect, an object in motion stays in motion. If you stop it, it'll start to go by itself again, because it's like... If you could reach out and grab it, yeah. and stop it, yeah. and then let it go, it would just come hurtling towards Earth. About eight minutes later, we'd have a <laughs> big boom. Yeah. How do they get it going? Well, they send it up in a rocket, right? And they fire those rockets, and they get it going at just the right speed. What would happen if they fired it too hard? That it'd be gone, right? Gone. Because gravity wouldn't be able to keep it in orbit. And if they didn't fire it fast enough, well, then it would... Right? Hit the earth. So they got to find that sweet spot. Just guessing. No, they, they do calculations. <laughs> they remember their calculator and they do calculations. On how big the calculator is. What do you mean? How big? You think their calculators are bigger? <laughs> yeah, imagine all the buttons they must have. <laughs> like that, Like that holster with your protractor I was talking about earlier, yeah. Okay, so that's what's actually happening. They're actually falling and going horizontally, and so they go falling around like that. There's a famous picture of, I think it was Newton who sort of discovered this. He got thinking about going up on a tall mountain and doing the tennis ball toss, and realized that if the bird was round, that if you went high enough and tossed it, right, the picture kind of looks like this. He's up on a mountain, right, and he tosses the ball. And he realized that if you tossed it faster and faster and faster, that eventually... So they just guessed a bunch of times to finally got it right, and they just curved it down and Yeah, that's what they did. I actually calculated, if you were to throw a tennis ball, if I were to throw it at Billy or Matt, and I wanted it to orbit the Earth, it'd be about from here to the solo site in a less than a second. That's how fast you have to throw it to orbit the Earth. To the what site? Oh, to Country Fest. Okay, so what's that, about 10, 12, so like about 12 kilometers a second, I think, is the orbit speed. How many meters is that? I would tear my rotator cuff from that. Well, that would be like, if you say it's 10 kilometers, it'd be like 10,000 meters a second. A gun. Oh, so, so, you you could, so if you could make a bullet that goes 10,000 meters a second. You could make it hard, and it'd be like the cartoons where Bugs Bunny gets hit in the back of the head, right? Would it come like you would know because the wind went everywhere we just messy up. See there's the thing, right? Oh. At, we're on Earth, so there's gonna be air resistance exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the thoughts are maintaining the moon comes from. Pardon me? That's where the thoughts are maintaining the moon comes from. Yeah. So the vector sum of the horizontal motion and gravity causes the orbit to Earth uh, to the shuttle orbit to Earth at high speed. Since gravity is constantly pulling down the astronauts, they are in constant free fall, which is what we call apparent weightlessness. That's not when your mom or your dad is weightless. That's not what I mean. Apparent weightlessness. Okay? This means you can't measure it. If I were to jump out of a plane, and I'm not going to with my nerd scale, strapped to my feet, right? I'm standing on the plane. The plane says, still in our new And I jump out of the plane. What would the scale read? No, you're not on the scale. Nothing. No, if I had to strap it on right there. If I'll put it on, it would show nothing. Okay, let's stop there. Is that good? Kind of, sort of? It's basically what I've done is I've explained weightlessness and I've explained what orbit is. Okay? And we're going to keep coming back to it. It's not something that you sort of get sort of the first time. Some of you will need multiple 
uh, explanations. I will pause there. Okay, so that should be D, right? So basically, we're going to use all those formulas all over again. Okay. Let's clarify. That. Yeah, that's a good question. Real good. Okay, so example number one here's a scary sound drive, the demon drop. You can just imagine the paint job on it. The demon drop is a ride at an amusement park. You watch it in time, it's free fall time at 1.5 seconds because you're too afraid to get on it. And this is what I do at amusement parks is I time things and figure out how fast they go. I do! And my, my, my yeah, wife and my yeah. kids usually stand away from me. Yeah, but you stop I do not. I do it discreetly. <laughs> I, I only did it once. I was curious. I, mean, you had to when you I was because I went home and looked up how high I was and I was like within about five meters. I was like, yes. <laughs> I know. I have a sickness. <laughs> okay, so the free fall time is 1.5 seconds. How fast is it going when it reaches the bottom and how high is the ride? Does this seem easy? No. No? Well, what do we know here? We know the time is 1.5, and that's all we know. Uh-oh. What's acceleration? It is not decelerating. It's crashing to the ground. So it's accelerating. Yes, it's killing everyone. Exactly. There's one more thing we know. What is it? Yes. And quite often, it's not going to be mentioned in the question, so you got to remember that yourself. Billy, really, you should definitely be writing this down. Did I not give you this sheet? What? Where's the sheet, man? Did you put it away already? No, I didn't get one. What? I didn't get one. I didn't get one. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Can't have that. Are you always going to know gravity in every month? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, how fast is it going when it reaches the bottom? Hey, this isn't too bad. All this is is A equals delta V over delta T. And again, I say, please write the formula. What is the acceleration? Minus 9.8. Solve for delta V. The time? 1.5. No, like A equals delta V. So I got 1.5 times 9.8. I should know this. 14.7. Now, that's the change in velocity. Is that equal to how fast it's going when it reaches the bottom? No. It will be. That will be the final velocity. Why? Because it's starting at zero, right? So delta V is equal to VF when the initial is zero. So it's going about 14.7, which is about 50 kilometers an hour. 52, 53. How high is the ride? Is there anyone feeling a little bit unsettled by that? That mistake I made on purpose. See how many people I can catch. Are you kidding me? I'm writing it. No, I'm not. Because if you're blindly copying down and not thinking, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. I made that mistake on purpose. You may not believe me, but it's true. What did I do wrong? I didn't find the average. How many people have made this mistake on a test? Me. Lots of you. This is V bar. This is VF. They are two different things. V bar is VI plus VF all over 2. The initial is 0. The final is 14.7. So the average is, what's that going to be? 7.35. That's the number that's used here. So hopefully you were thinking. If you weren't, 
Be careful. I'm going to be doing this from now on, making mistakes. If you're blindly copying, you're going to end up having a race. I'm a wily kind of guy. 11 meters. How high is the demon drop? 11 lousy meters. That's not that scary. That's like the height of the gym. Is that a hard question? Kind of. got the four more questions. What are you talking about? Four marks. One, two, three. Maybe three. Three and a half. Where's the other half? T and the A. Writing those down? Yeah. I showed that I picked up. Oh. No. Okay. Lane, concentrate. This is the part where you'll learn stuff. But did you learn it? Just writing it down isn't learning it. Just writing it down isn't learning it. You guys got to get that out of your head. Okay, I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to be quiet because you're tired of listening. Right, Peter? Good answer. Tell me more stories, Mr. Bennett. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Use his example. It still means you got to pay attention to learn. Writing it down is not learning. Okay. Example number two. Last one, I promise. Tennis ball is thrown upward with an initial velocity of plus 22.5. Why is it plus? Because it's going up. Because it's going up. Good. Cool. It's caught at the same distance above the ground from which it was thrown. In other words, the it's like 20... No, I guess I don't want to say that. Here, Here's the stick figure person. And there's the ball. It's thrown up. And then it's caught at the same same height, right? There's no light landing at the ground, I think. How high does the ball rise? And how long does the ball remain in the air? I want to know that distance there. And I want to know the... Total time. Does this seem hard to do? Yeah. Is it any different than this one? I got the. I, well, I don't have the time here, right? I guess it is different. Okay, fair enough. So, what do I know? Gravity. Good. I know the initial velocity is 22.5. I know gravity is. The acceleration is minus 9.8. Do I know anything else? There's one more thing that you know that you might not realize that you know. <laughs> Skinny legs and not much hair. What do you know about the tennis ball? There's one more piece of information that you know, but you might not realize it yet. Well, I've got the initial velocity. I've got the acceleration. What do I have to solve for? I'm solving for D. And I also need to find time. But there's one more thing that you know that you final don't have. Where is the final velocity zero? Right there. Exactly. Right there, the final velocity is zero, right? Because it goes up and it stops on one tail and it comes back down. Would you think that the time up and the time down are the same? The distance up and the distance down are certainly the same. Yes. Okay, so that's the one thing that you do know. So what here then is the change in velocity? Well, it's going to be 0 minus 22.5. Not surprisingly, the change in velocity is 22.5 minus 22.5. Can I find the time with that? Sure. That's the B bar, right? Can I find the time? Yes. A equals delta V over delta T minus 9.8 is equal to my delta V is minus 22.5 and we're going to solve for time. Delta T change in time. Two point three seconds. The time up is 2.3 seconds. That is pretty far, isn't it? Two, one, two, eh, that's just, you could probably do it. 
Not interrogator, no. But I wanted to know how high the ball rises. The only way to tell how how do I use this time for how high it rises? No. I think I do, right? But before I can figure out how high it rises, I need to find the average. Now I'm going to divide by two. So 22.5 plus zero all over two. Notice how I write the formula. Line up the equal signs. Willie, put it away. Pay attention. Learn. And now that I've got that, do I use 2.3? Yeah, because that's the time up. Right? I'm real close to that here. It's only 25 meters up. You could throw a ball 25 meters in the air. You could do that. But, so this is, this is all part A. How long does the ball remain in the air? What's the total time? No, we found the time to the top, right? Yeah, the total time is going to be 2.3. How do you figure out how long it stays in the top? It, it just, like, it stops and then it goes right back down, right? That's peak. That's peak. That's where the VF is zero. Right? Okay, so how many marks here? One, two, three, four, five. Are you starting to see how you got to have the formulas and things laid out? Like, if you just throw the numbers down, oh, I can just punch them in and give you the answer. It's not going to work anymore. The questions are getting longer. you got to stop doing that. Yeah. Okay, I can tell you guys are done. You need, need to be quiet. Okay, so I'm going to give you some time to work. We've got a problem package here. The first page is thinking kind of questions. You can start with those. Okay, as we work along here, I'm going to give you the answer to those. Okay, and then when we get into uh, the problem pack there, you should be trying some of those. For sure, I always like to mention TV three questions up here by the helicopter. You need to be able to do those. First three. Okay. Nine. Put a star on those. You may not be ready for them yet, but Seven, you eight, need nine. to be able to do those. Seven, Seven eight, nine. Okay. I need to do more sample questions for you to be able to do sort of every all these different types here. But for now, start with the concept review questions. How about we make a deal? Oh, I've got the QR code there for you as well. How about uh, you've got about 20 minutes or so. I will give you the answers to the first five tomorrow. How does that sound? Five questions is more than, that's a good amount, I think, right? You can get that done, it's not too much. Do the first five, do as many as you can, and we'll do some more problems tomorrow.